afternoon um, to the Honorable Dr. Santi Martini as our Dean of Erlanga University, Faculty of Public Health, and to the Honorable Mr. Trias Mahmudiono as the Vice Dean Tree of Public Health, Public Health Faculty, Erlanga University, to Dr. Kelly as our guest lecturer from Queensland University, and to the Honorable Dr. Nurul Widajati as our head department of occupational health and safety. And to all the lecturers that has spared your time to attend this webinar, Mr. Denny and okay, Mr. Denny, Miss Mrs. Indriati, and Mrs. Putri Ayun. And to all the students from Bachelor Degree of Occupational Health and Safety, Faculty of Public Health, Erlanga University, whom I loved. Okay, so today uh, I would like to introduce myself. I'm Dain Tanisa Shaifo, a Bachelor Degree student of Occupational Health and Safety Department, Faculty of Public Health, Erlanga University. I'm here as your host and moderator, and I will uh, guide you through this webinar series from the start until the end. Before we start our guest lecture agenda, I would like to give you some rules and term of conditions. So this guest lecture agenda will be held in approximately two hours, which is the presentation will be in one hour and the Q&A session or questions and answer sessions will be in one hour. So. To all participants and students who wants to ask to Dr. Kelly, you can hit the chat or message box and I will read it at the end of the presentation sessions, which is in question and answer sessions. So, uh, untuk teman-teman yang dan uh, peserta yang ingin menanyakan kepada Dr. Kelly, bisa mengetik di chat box di Zoom message untuk menanyakan kepada Dr. Kelly. Dan apabila ingin menanyakan ke, uh, kepada Dr. Kelly dalam bahasa Indonesia, uh, diperbolehkan dan akan saya translate kepada Dr. Kelly dengan bahasa Inggris. Okay. So before the agenda took place, uh, I, will like, I would like to welcome Dr. Santi Martini as our Dean of Faculty of Public Health at Langa University to give some opening remarks in this agenda. For Dr. Santi Martini, the time is yours. Okay, sorry. Thank you, Mbak Dayinta. Okay. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Waalaikumsalam warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Alhamdulillah. Thanks to Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala for this beautiful day and occasion. Good day, everyone. Glad to see you all today. I hope you are in a good health and good condition. Thank you for Department of Occupational Health and Safety, Universitas Erlangga, as hosting and managing uh, this webinar. First of all, I would like to greet our guest speaker, Dr. Kelly Johnston from Occupational Health and Safety Science Program, the University of Queensland. Welcome to Universitas Erlangga, Dr. Kelly. Thank you. Yes, you we do. Me. Yes. Uh, this is the first time you, uh, you delivered uh, your uh, your lecture with our university. Yes, this is the first time with this university. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Thank you very much for your time uh, to be our guest lecture today. No problems. Yes. We do expect that from today's webinar, our student and researcher learn much from uh, your knowledge and experience, and hopefully it will open opportunity for further research collaboration. The topic for today is 
pesticide exposure in agricultural workers, human exposure and risk assessment. This sounds very interesting and crucial in public health, particularly in occupational health and safety, as well as for environmental health. Especially uh, in Indonesia, we have uh, many, many farmers here and uh, they use uh, pesticide. Yeah, most of, most of them use pesticide. As we might already knew that pesticide is like a coin that has two faces. It brings both sides of benefits and hazard. It has been widely used for controlling factors of disease, such as mosquitoes, rats, uh, and also eradicate insect, pests, rodents, fungi, and unnecessary plants. This is indicated as beneficial site for supporting agriculture and plantation. However, pesticide also bring hazard to human health and, and endanger the, the balance of ecosystem. The toxic compounds of pesticide are needed to be managed wisely and carefully to minimize the drawbacks. Therefore, in, it doesn't propose any adverse effect for human and environment. Today we will learn how we take a part of scientists or researcher or student in occupational health and safety to bring contribution in solving these issues. Of course, we need to have sufficient knowledge and skills to identify the hazard, how to analyze the severity of the hazard, in this case, organophosphate pesticide. And by the end of study, it's also important to assess the potential risk both to human health and environment. In order we could determine and formulate better prevention or intervention. We hope that today's webinar and discussion enhance our perspective, knowledge and vision as academician in occupational health and safety and also public health. Therefore, we could produce highly qualified research and contribute for solving, of solving the problems in our community or population. Finally, I formally open the, uh, yeah, finally. Uh, Dainta, you asked me to open the webinar. Uh, for opening remarks. Yes. Oh, only for opening remarks, yeah? Okay. Okay, once again, Dr. Kelly, thank you very much for your time today uh, to share your knowledge, your experience to us, uh, the students and also the lecturer. And we hope that uh, we can have uh, more activity with you mm -hmm. in the future. Not, uh, not only this webinar, maybe we can develop a joint research or joint activity. Maybe we, have, we can have a workshop and then you are uh, uh, one of the speaker and also you can ask your student to join with the workshop. Mm -hmm. And also if the pandemic is end, maybe you can come to our uh, university in Surabaya and your and also your student can come, he uh, can come to our campus and our student and our lecturer can uh, visit your campus in uh, Australia. Okay, uh, because uh, the pandemic, so we can, I think uh, for, uh, for delivering the lecture, we can have uh, this platform uh, with the Zoom uh, to share our knowledge, yeah. So, uh, yeah, because the pandemic, we cannot uh, have a meeting uh, in person or face to face. Yeah. Okay, once again, thank you very much, Dr. Kelly. Dr. Kelly, yeah. And also, thank you very much for the student uh, joining with this uh, webinar. And please, you can. Uh, you can uh, Hopefully you can get many, uh, uh, what we call, uh, you can learn much from uh, Dr. Kelly 
uh, about how uh, to manage the pesticide. And from this uh, lecture, you can get uh, some what we call a clue or insightful, so you can uh, develop a uh, research yeah, uh, uh, for your uh, thesis and also for the lecturer, you can also uh, develop a joint research with, the, with Dr. Kelly. Okay, once again, thank you very much for Department of Occupational Health and Safety. Okay, thank you. Uh, Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Waalaikumsalam warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Thank you, Bu Santi. Yeah. yeah. Thank you, uh, Bu Santi, for the yeah. Thank you. Okay, so thank you. Let's move on to our next agenda. The next agenda is about. Uh, the introduction of our guest lecturer. So I would like to share the curriculum vitae of Dr. Kelly. Okay, uh, to the participants, can you see my share screen? Okay. So I would like to introduce you to our guest lecturer Yes, lecturer. So this is Dr. Kelly Johnston, the senior lecturer of Occupational Health and Safety Science Program, School of Earth and Environmental Science, Faculty of Science, the University of Queensland. So Dr. Kelly is a senior lecturer that has many uh, experiences and education qualifications. For the latest educations and qualifications, she has pursued his, uh, her master degree or of science, occupational hygiene practice from July 20 and 20, 2012 until July 2014 in University of Wollongong. Then the Doctor of Philosophy in Queensland University of Technology under the project Organophosphate Pesticide Ex Exposure in Agricultural Workers, Human Exposure and Race Assessment. And for the bachelor degree is from Queensland University of Technology Project under the project Volatile Organic Compounds in the Indoor Space of a Brisbane Office Building. Besides, Dr. Kelly has many experiences and goals. For the experiences, she has uh, experience in supervision, supervision and uh, consultant, especially in occupational hygiene. There are four experiences and, and there's many sub experiences in occupational hygiene consultant. And for the professional membership, she is a certified occupational hygienist, Australian Institute of Occupational Hygienists, fellow and certified chartered general OS professional, Australian Institute of Health and Safety. And for the publications of her scientific articles, Dr. Kelly has eight conference publications and six scientific article publications, also two peer-reviewed conference papers. And lastly, Dr. Kelly has two research grants publications. So that's all the the profile of Dr. Kelly Johnston. Then let's move on to the next agenda for the presentations and the materials from Dr. Cal Dr. Kelly under the title Organophosphate Pesticide Exposure in Agricultural Workers, Human Exposure and Risk Assessment. For Dr. Kelly Johnston, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dean. It's a very professional introduction. Thank you. Uh, I will just share my screen so we can go to the PowerPoint. Let's see, is this, can you see my PowerPoint slides? Yes, Dr. K. Yeah. Okay, so this was this project was my PhD research. I, I understand that quite a few of you are bachelor's students studying occupational health and safety. So congratulations, what an excellent decision to choose to study such an important and interesting field or discipline. Uh, I 
did this research quite a few years ago now. It was finished in 2006 and um, I very much enjoyed doing my PhD research. So I do encourage students to think to do further study after finishing your bachelor's degree and to get involved with research because it is, uh, if you're interested in that type of work, it is very, it is fascinating and very rewarding. So I, um, tonight I've been, oh, today, this afternoon, tonight here in Australia, this afternoon, I've been asked to speak to you about my PhD uh, research. So I thought we'd better start with some basics about uh, what organophosphate pesticides are. So they are, they are commonly used uh, in pesticides. They were first recognized in the late or mid 1800s and they were first synthesized in Germany in the 1930s as organophosphate pesticides. But they did uh, also determine during World War II that these pesticides could be used as nerve agents. And so they were developed by the Germans as nerve agents, uh, called Zoman, Tabin and Serin, but were never used during World War II, thank goodness. Uh, after following the war, they were further developed to be used as organophosphate pesticides to kill insects mainly on crops. And today they are used throughout the world as uh, mainly insecticides. So in terms of their chemical formula, they have uh, some common chemical properties. They have a central uh, phosphorus atom with a double bond to either um, a sulfur or an oxygen um, atom. They have an R1 and R2 groups that are either ethyl or methyl in structure. And they have a unique leaving group. So this part here. So this is the general chemical structure of organophosphate pesticides. And each individual organophosphate pesticide uh, has its own chemical formula. And this is an example of a common OP pesticide called chlorpyrifos, uh, with the pink part here being its unique uh, leaving group. So there are quite a number of different organophosphate pesticides and they have different levels of toxicity. So the toxicity of a chemical can be in terms of its ability to kill a test species. So they uh, conduct tests mainly with mice and other experimental animals to determine what concentration is required to kill 50% of the test population. So mice, for example. So when we look at this slide here, we can see some common uh, types of organophosphate pesticides. So their common name and their trade name and the four different categories based on their oral toxicity, so if swallowed by the person or the test species, and their dermal toxicity, so if absorbed through the skin. So you can see that they range from highly toxic, so parathion being the most toxic, uh, through to less toxic, such as acephate, uh, which requires many times more the dose to be, to be toxic. Uh, organophosphate pesticides are used in a few main industries. So agriculture is a, a large consumer or user of organophosphate pesticides for different types of insects on crops, also for uh, insect control in sheep, so sheep dipping, uh, and in cotton and grain crops. But they can also be used for domestic pest control so for controlling ants, spiders, cockroaches, termites, et cetera, around people's homes, um, office buildings, et cetera. And they can be used for disinfection of ship holds and warehouses. And obviously they need to be formulated. So the people involved in manufacturing the products for use, so the pesticide formulators as well. So what happens when we're exposed to OP pesticides? So what is its toxicokinetics? Uh, they are efficiently absorbed by our skin. And that is the main route of exposure in the occupational setting is when the chemical comes in contact with the human skin. So hands, arms, fore forearms, neck, 
those sorts of areas that can be uh, absorbed very effectively through the skin, through intact skin. We can also inhale the pesticide. So depending on how it's being sprayed or applied, if it becomes an aerosol, we can inhale it. Um, and the ingestion is also possible. So this can be accidental ingestion. Uh, it can be, say, a farmer is trying to uh, unblock a nozzle. So they might be spraying. They might be spraying the pesticide and uh, need to unblock nozzles and use poor work practices by uh, using their mouth just to clear the blockage and can accidentally ingest pesticide that way. Um, they can have uh, contamination on their hands and then uh, get accidental ingestion when eating or drinking or smoking cigarettes can be ways of accidental ingestion. If people store the pesticides in food or drinking containers, people can accidentally um, ingest the pesticide. Um, or some, sometimes there are cases of people purposefully ingesting the pesticide. Uh, but the main route of exposure in the occupational setting is skin or dermal exposure combined with some inhalation exposure. It can also be um, absorbed through the mucous membranes around the eyes uh, to varying degrees depending on the OP. Once the pesticide is absorbed into the body, uh, breakdown mainly occurs via a hydrolysis process, so using water to break the bonds, and this occurs in the liver uh, to varying rates depending on the type of pesticide. Um, so OP esters are rapidly hydrolyzed in the, in the liver and they produce metabolites or breakdown products called alkyl phosphates or dialkyl phosphates and phenols. And these breakdown products typically have little toxicity and they are excreted in the urine and feces of the person. So 70% of OPs are metabolized into one or more of these six common breakdown products. So depending on the type of organophosphate pesticide, they will typically break down into one or more of the DE type uh, metabolites or one or more of the DM type metabolites, depending on the type of organophosphate pesticide. What is their mode of action or how do they uh, cause toxic effects for humans? they target enzymes in the nervous system. So OP poisoning occurs via phosphorylation or what we call inhibition of the acetylcholine esterase, esterase enzyme at nerve endings. So acetylcholine esterase is responsible for removing acetylcholine, which is a nerve transmitter. So when you have a smaller amounts of acetylcholine esterase, then uh, the nerve transmitter acetylcholine can build up in nerve synapses and you basically have overstimulation of the nervous system. So the message keeps being sent in your nervous system because there's no uh, or, or minimal acetylcholine esterase enzyme to take away the acetylcholine nerve transmitter. Uh, the body is able to produce new acetylcholine esterase um, to replace what's been lost through this chemical reaction. But the synthesis of new acetylcholine esterase in the nervous system can take up to 60 days to complete. So if, this, if a person is working with organophosphate pesticides over a period of days, weeks, months and being exposed, their levels of acetylcholine esterase uh, can be being removed over that time. And because there's a slow period of replacing it, we can get um, a buildup of toxic effects in the system. Um, I do have a little video here to show what normally happens at your nerve synapses, but I don't know if it's going to work. So we'll just see. Action potentials arriving at the presynaptic terminal cause voltage gated calcium ion channels to open. Calcium ions diffuse into the cell and cause synaptic vesicles to release acetylcholine, a neurotransmitter molecule. 
Acetylcholine molecules diffuse from the presynaptic terminal across the synaptic cleft and bind to their receptor sites on the ligand-gated sodium ion channels. This causes the ligand-gated sodium ion channels to open and sodium ions diffuse into the cell, making the membrane potential more positive. If the membrane potential reaches threshold level, an action potential will be produced. Hopefully you were able to hear that as well as see it. It's just showing that what normally happens. And so when uh, we have pesticide exposure and acetylcholine esterase is removed, this keeps happening because we've got a buildup of acetylcholine at our nerve endings. So obviously there is a dose response relationship in terms of health effects, uh, particularly when we're talking about acute health effects. So depending on how much pesticide you're exposed to and over what period of time, uh, we can, it'll depend on therefore how much acetylcholine esterase is inhibited or blocked from acting in our bodies. So if 50 to 60% inhibition occurs, then that's considered mild poisoning. And we can see the types of clinical symptoms that would appear. So weakness, headache, dizziness, nausea, et cetera and recovery takes one to three days. Moving to the next level, 60 to 90% inhibition is considered moderate poisoning and our symptoms are more severe. So we have abrupt weaknesses, visual disturbance, sweating, vomiting, et cetera, through to 90 to 100% inhibition, which is severe poisoning, which can, uh, is, can be life-threatening if we don't get uh, prompt medical attention to reverse that chemical reaction, um, death can occur. So acute effects require quite a significant exposure to the pesticide over a short period of time. But we also have the appearance of chronic effects from lower level exposures. And there are two main types of chronic health effects. So there's the sequel to an acute poisoning incident so there has been um, cases or evidence to show that where somebody has had an acute poisoning, so this might be through accidental ingestion uh, or, or an accident in the workplace where a large amount of pesticide is spilt onto the skin, for example, uh, the person can recover from that acute poisoning but have ongoing uh, chronic effects. So things like irritability, anxiety, fatigue, etc., over a period of time following that acute exposure. Uh, but there is also some evidence in the literature that low level long term exposure without the occurrence of an acute poisoning can also lead to effects on the uh, neurological system on the nervous system. So it's unclear whether OP exposure at chronic low levels does cause nerve damage, but there are reports of um, ongoing neurological effects from people who've been exposed, such as in the UK, people who used to dip sheep. So they would have big bars of the pesticide and the sheep would be dipped into it to kill insects on the sheep. And people would be drenched with the pesticide and this would happen for years of a person's work exposure and uh, they have now ongoing chronic health effects from this exposure. So that brings us to the question of, well, how do we monitor workers' exposure to organophosphate pesticides? Well, there, there are two ways of looking at an individual worker's exposure. We can do uh, the, the use current tools, which is a blood cholinesterase activity test, or we can look at a relatively new test, which was the focus of my PhD research, which is a urine metabolite test, which tests for the concentration of those uh, breakdown products from exposure to the pesticides. Obviously, there are other options as well. So where a worker is, um, breathe, could breathe in the pesticide, we can obviously monitor the atmosphere for what the person could be breathing in. 
There are also other methods of looking at dermal exposure, so patches and other methods for looking at how much a person has come into contact with in terms of dermal exposure. But if we're looking at monitoring exposure from a health surveillance or health monitoring perspective, then the two main options are the blood test or a urine test. So traditionally, a blood test is carried out to, uh, for health surveillance purposes or biological monitoring purposes of workers. But the problem with the blood test is that it's quite insensitive. And so you need a very high dose or exposure to the pesticide uh, to pick up a reduction in cholinesterase. It's also what's called biological effect monitoring in that we are measuring the result of exposure or an effect on the body rather than actually measuring the concentration of the pesticide itself or of its metabolites. We're monitoring an effect. And the reduction of cholinesterase levels in the human body can be affected by other things apart from organophosphate pesticides. So that there are some illnesses or diseases that can affect cholinesterase levels. Individual people can have different levels from sort of day to day, week to week. Uh, so it can fluctuate. And uh, there are also other types of pesticides that can affect um, cholinesterase levels. To, accurate, to more accurately interpret the results of the blood cholinesterase test, we need to have a baseline for the worker. So each individual worker needs to have their cholinesterase their blood cholinesterase levels tested when they haven't been exposed for at least a two month period. And we need to take a series of tests over a period to establish the baseline for that worker. And so when we do blood cholinesterase testing, we're comparing the workers post exposure test results to a baseline level. Um, and the reason we need to have the baseline level is because there is large variability in col cholinesterase levels within a person and also from person to person. The other problem with the blood test is it's invasive. I don't like having a blood test and I'm pretty sure most people don't like having a blood test. And so that's another problem with the blood test. So the reason I conducted my PhD research on this topic was because at the time, the urine metabolite test was a newly available test in Australia. Uh, there hadn't been much research done on the use of the urine test. And there wasn't a lot of information available in Australia about the exposure levels of farmers to organophosphate pesticides. And so it was determined that my PhD research would investigate the usability of this urine metabolite test within the within agricultural workers in Australia. So in terms of an aim for my PhD project, the broad aim of the study was to characterize organophosphate pesticide exposure and to assess the feasibility of using the urine metabolite test as a risk assessment tool for the agricultural industry. Um, and I had an additional aim with my agricultural farmers, and that was to conduct a more in-depth evaluation of what their current knowledge, attitudes and behaviours were related to their handling of organophosphate pesticides and to find out what they already knew about the health effects of pesticides and how to assess their risk of exposure. In terms of the methods of the research project, we, I had a cross-sectional study design and I had three exposed groups and two control groups. So the exposed groups were fruit and vegetable farmers, agricultural pilots who were uh, flying planes over cotton crops to spray a pesticide, and their ground crew. So their ground crew were the people responsible for mixing the pesticide and loading it onto the planes. And then I also had one formulation plant in uh, New South Wales that was manufacturing the pesticides. I had two control groups. One were uh, retired or Toowoomba Rotary Club members. So they lived in a similar area to the farmers, but they did other jobs. So they didn't work in the agricultural industry but lived in a similar geographical area. 
And for the formulation plant, the control groups for them were the office workers that worked at the formulation plant. So I recruited 50 fruit and vegetable farmers from Brisbane to Gatton and Toowoomba, the Granite Belt and the Tambourine Mountains. And they completed an in-depth interview administered questionnaire with myself um, or one of my research assistants. And they also provided three urine samples as part of one of their spraying um, activities. And they completed a questionnaire with the urine samples about what they were doing around the time that the urine samples were collected. What pesticide were they spraying for how long, what methods on what crop, those sorts of things. <clears throat> the pilot mixer loaders, I had eight people who were the ones on the ground that were mixing the pesticide and loading it onto the planes. 10 pilots that were flying the uh, planes over the crops doing the spraying. Um, seven companies were involved out of 17 that were lo located in that area. So they were recruited from St. George and Gundawindi. And they provided four urine samples each and also a self-administered questionnaire about their work practices and the pesticides they were using. I had one formulation plant. I had difficulty recruiting formulation plants. They were reluctant to be involved in this research because uh, they, they believed that the urine metabolite test is far more sensitive than the blood test that they were currently using. And so were reluctant to participate in the research. But I did eventually manage to recruit one company who was willing to participate. And they had nine people who were formulators whose job it was to have hands-on contact with the uh, like 99% pure OP that's then um, has carriers added to it, et cetera, to formulate the pesticide. So high potential for exposure. And they provided pre and post exposure urine samples for three days, as well as a blood sample and a self-administered questionnaire about their hygiene practices, their work practices, etc. So the control group was the 44 Toowoomba Rotary Club members. Um, and then 11 controls from the formulation plant. And they completed a self-administered questionnaire and provided um, urine samples for the study. So their questionnaire asked them questions about how much uh, fruit and vegetables they eat, whether they have their own home vegetable gardens, uh, if they've bought cut, fresh cut flowers recently. Uh, basically it was asking any questions about potential exposure to pesticides in the community or in the environment or because of their diet. Uh, it also of course asked them about their occupation and whether that occupation had potential for exposure to pesticides. So when all the data was collected, it was entered into Excel originally and then to SPSS for, um, for the questionnaires. It was descriptive statistics, bivariate analysis with chi-square and odds ratios and multivariate modeling with binary logistic regression with a two-tail p-value for statistical um, significance of 0.05. And for the biological sampling results, so the blood and urine results, uh, in terms of analysis there, they were not normally distributed, um, so which is to be expected with this type of data. Uh, so we also dichotomized the results into uh, detected or not detected, and we used crude odds ratios as well as some multi, uh, as well as some other. Um, non-normally distributed appropriate statistical analysis. So what did we find? Well, it was very interesting. So we expected that the farmers, that the fruit and vegetable growers would have a fairly high exposure to the pesticides, um, when actually it didn't turn out that way. So what were the demographics? Um, well, the farmers were all males. They were aged between 16 and 67, 
but the mean age was 45. In Australia, we have um, an aging population and our agricultural workers, um, even more so, uh, we, a lot of our farmers are older people, hence the mean age of 45. 88.2% were the farm owners. So they were typically small business, family run farms. Um, they had worked on average for 20 years on their current farm, but that ranged from one year to 62 years having worked on their current farm. They typically grew four different types of crops over the last 12 months. And the most common crops were pumpkins, onions, stone fruit, avocados, tomatoes, etc. I won't read them all out, but that gives you an idea of uh, who the farmers were. Um, in terms of how they sprayed their pesticides, they typically sprayed the pesticides via a tractor driven boom. So similar to this picture here, the tractor with a boom on the back uh, that sprayed the pesticides. 35% of them only had a tractor with an enclosed cab. Most of them um, had an open cab. Uh, the farmers had applied on average pesticides 20 times, so on 20 occasions over the last 12 months. And the most common pesticides sprayed were clopyrifos and dimethoate. Um, hands and arms were the most frequently, um, most frequent body parts to come into contact with the pesticide while applying. Half the farmers reported that they are not given a safety data sheet by the supplier of the pesticides, even though that is a legal requirement. And safety data sheets were not frequently read and many didn't know what a safety data sheet was. So this is uh, not good in terms of farmers' knowledge of the health, potential health effects or uh, access to the important information on safety data sheets. Uh, farmers also reported that they rarely read the pesticide label before they applied it. And I think this is mainly because they use the same pesticides regularly. They may have read the label in the past and so they are going off information that they had uh, researched previously rather than checking the label before each application. 75% of the farmers had never read about or been shown how to carry out a risk assessment for the OP pesticide use. And that's not, you know, that would be expected. The majority of farmers had never had any health surveillance performed for their pesticide exposure. However, we did ask them questions about their knowledge and their attitudes and their beliefs to pesticide use. And they actually scored quite highly on their knowledge. So the median score was 12 out of 13, correct. So they did know that OP pesticides could cause health effects and they understood the type of health effects they could cause. They understood that they should use personal protective equipment. So they had some good knowledge. Over 75% of them had completed what we call in Australia a chem cert AgVet chemical handling training. So three quarters of them had done some training in how to safely use pesticides. And this is usually because the uh, people they want to sell their fruit and vegetables to require them to have done this chemical training as part of that process. 41% of them felt that it was too hot and uncomfortable to wear personal protective equipment in the warmer months. So like Indonesia in Australia here, it gets very hot and humid. And so almost half the farmers or 41% of the farmers didn't like to wear personal protective equipment like a mask, gloves, et cetera, because it was too hot to do that. Higher levels of education, being a younger farmer and high knowledge scores on the test we gave them um, and low risk perception were associated with increased use of personal protective equipment. High risk perception was associated with lower use of PPE. Now that sounds a bit strange because normally I would have thought if you thought that something was very risky then you would want to protect yourself. 
Uh, but whereas what we actually found was because the farmers had a good level of knowledge about the risks involved with pesticide exposure, they knew they should wear their personal protective equipment. They knew that that's what they should do. But because they were choosing not to do it, they believed that they were at higher risk. So they actually knew the risk that they were taking. It was a calculated risk and they were doing it. Even though they knew they should wear the PPE and that they were risking exposure, they were still deciding that they shouldn't wear their PPE. And they determined that this was a risk, but they, that's what they wanted to do. Um, so when we looked at their urine sample results, there wasn't any real clear pattern of excretion of the urine uh, of the uh, pesticide metabolites in the urine, which we would have expected there to be a pattern of exposure, but there wasn't. And the metabolite DMTP, if I just go back, oops, the metabolite DMTP was the metabolite most frequently detected in all the urine samples. Um, so it was detected in 25% of the pre-exposure samples and 31% of the post-exposure samples. So farmers levels were typically low with median DMTP concentrations ranging from 18 to 29.5 micromoles of the metabolite per mole of creatinine. So I don't know if you understand about uh, urine tests for metabolites, uh, but when you do a urine test, you need to correct it for the concentration of the urine. So I think you'd all be familiar that if you drink a lot of water, then your urine is quite diluted. Uh, if you don't drink enough water, then your urine can be very concentrated. And so when you do a urine test to look at someone's exposure, sort of for health surveillance or biomonitoring, you need to correct the concentration of what you're looking for based on how concentrated the urine is. Um, and if it's too concentrated or too weak, then you have to disregard the results of the sample because uh, it's outside of your limits. So I think it's 0.3. Uh, it has to be more than 0.3 grams per litre and uh, not more than 3 grams per litre of creatinine in the urine to be an acceptable range. Um, so two risk factors for having a higher concentration in the urine were spending longer applying the pesticide or reporting that the farmers were eating, drinking or talking on their mobile phone while they were applying the pesticide. So this meant you were more likely to have higher concentrations in your urine. <clears throat> so you can just have a quick look there at some of the uh, results that we received for the urine levels. Uh, and then you can see in this graph here that there really isn't any clear pattern of exposure. It sort of was all over the place. So this would have been their pre-exposure sample and then two post-exposure samples, but there wasn't any real clear pattern. Um, so with our uh, pilots and the mixer loaders, the DMTP was again, the most frequently detected of the metabolites. Um, even though DMTP, um, so type of OP spray was not a predictor of the type of metabolite excreted, even though we would have expected that. Um, the pilot mixer loaders did have higher concentrations of the metabolites in their urine. Um, and there was a predictable relationship between the reported use of their personal protective equipment and whether we detected concentrations in the urine. So low PPE use was associated with a 1.75 times increased odds of having a higher concentration in your urine. And if you were performing the measuring and mixing tasks, that was associated with a 3.37 times increased odds of having detectable levels. So with this group, the pilot mixer loaders, they're typically using bigger quantities of the pesticide because they're loading it in, mixing it up and loading it into planes. So the people on the ground uh, have more chance of coming into dermal contact, particularly with the pesticide during the mixing and loading into the plane. 
Uh, the control groups who weren't occupationally exposed to the pesticide, we were expecting that they wouldn't have any metabolites in their urine when actually they did. So they had DMTP was found in their urine. 25% of samples had a detectable level and the median concentration was 35.8 micromoles um, of DMTP per mole of creatinine. And it ranged from 9.5 all the way up to 91.3. So we then tried to compare these groups. So there was no difference between the pre-exposure samples for any of the groups. <clears throat> there was no difference between the farmers post-exposure results and the control samples, which is good for the farmers. It means that they must be doing something right in terms of exposure controls. Um, statistically significant difference was found between the pilots and ground crew uh, post exposure results compared to our control group. <clears throat> so the pilots and the mixer loaders did have a higher exposure than background levels in the controls. Uh, then we move to the formulator group. They had the highest levels, which is what we would expect because they're working with the highly concentrated form of the pesticide. 55% uh, had detectable levels of the metabolite from the pesticide they were using, which was DEP, was the metabolite from that specific pesticide they were formulating. And you can see the levels are a lot higher, 53.4 to 550 but we did detect DMTP again, and this was not a metabolite from the pesticides they were formulating. There were two risk factors uh, for having detectable levels, and they were obviously being a formulator and uh, spilling, reporting that they spilt the pesticide on their work overalls while they were at work. So again, in the control group, the only metabolite detected was DMTP in over half the samples and the medium was 25 micromoles per mole creatinine. <clears throat> and this just um, a quick table of the results there. Again, not really any patterns of um, exposure, but a bit better than the, the farmers group. So there was no difference between controls and the exposed group for DMTP, but we wouldn't expect that because it wasn't a metabolite from the pesticide they were formulating. Statistically significant difference between controls and exposed groups for DEP, which was the metabolite of the pesticide they were making. Um, <clears throat> we also found no relationship between the blood cholinesterase levels for these workers and their urine metabolite levels. And this was because this company had not established baselines for their workers. So even though it, it is a legal requirement that for them to have baseline for their workers, they did not have a baseline level for their workers. So the use of the blood test is quite limited because we can't compare it to individual workers baseline level. So what does all this mean? Well, I think hopefully you've picked up during the discussion that this strange metabolite DMTP keeps coming up in everyone's urine samples or a lot of people's urine samples, um, even though we weren't expecting it. So other published research has reported that this metabolite is either most frequently detected or it's detected in the highest concentration. So this is from research in the US and the UK and other parts of the world. Reasons for this may include environmental exposure to pesticides present in our food, our water and on surfaces, or exposure to the metabolite DMTP itself, because organophosphate pesticides rapidly break down in the environment. And so people could be being exposed to either the parent compound in food, water or on surfaces, or the metabolite itself in food, water, or on surfaces. Um, and there was a, a, some published research I found that studied people's consumption of fruit juice. And they found that the metabolite DMTP was present in the fruit juice itself. <clears throat> and so data collected on environmental exposures revealed that consuming 
higher amounts, so four to 10 servings per day of fruit and vegetables was associated with having detectable levels of OP pesticides, um, their metabolites in the urine, but it was not a statistically significant relationship. And having a home vegetable garden was associated with having higher levels of, uh, sorry, not having a home vegetable garden was associated with having higher levels of DMTP. So this is, a, this is the theory that people who grow their own vegetables at home aren't spraying those vegetables with pesticides. And so the vegetables they're eating aren't contaminated with pesticides. <clears throat> so urine metabolite concentrations in our farmers' samples were much lower than we expected. In fact, in most cases, they were actually similar or lower than the control group samples. Um, and this is actually a similar finding to what's been reported in very comprehensive studies in the UK, in the United Kingdom. So the UK Health and Safety Executive Laboratory was one of the first places in the world to use the urine metabolite test. And they have completed numerous uh, published studies in this area. And their laboratory reported on over 10 years of sampling and over 917 samples. Um, and I'll just skip to that. <clears throat> so they uh, reported from their laboratory from over 900 samples that people who are not occupationally exposed, so you're not a farmer, you're not a formulator, you have no occupational exposure, that you will have 90% um, of samples had 50 micromoles per mole creatinine or less in the urine and 95% of samples had 72 or less in the urine. So you actually have detectable levels in your urine, even when you have no occupational exposure. Uh, but if you are occupationally exposed, so you are a farmer, or a pesticide uh, formulator or a pest control person for people's homes, then 90% of samples had less than 77 and 95% had less than 122 micromoles per mole creatinine. Um, and the, the results that I found in my PhD study was very similar to these, two, these results from the United Kingdom. Um, in another study, a human volunteer study, where they gave volunteers one milligram oral doses of organophosphate pesticides, uh, the mean peak uh, concentrations found in the urine from a one milligram oral dose was 160, 750 and 404 micromoles per mole creatinine. And these levels were not associated with a reduction in blood cholinesterase activity. So these low levels here that we found in our study and that were found in the UK study would not be associated with a drop in blood cholinesterase levels because it's too low a concentration. The group with the highest levels were formulators and 90% of their samples were less than 188 micromoles per mole creatinine, which is still not high enough to have a drop in blood cholinesterase levels. Uh, in the United States, the Centers for Disease Control conducted a, a large study of the US population. Um, and it was this data is from the National Health and Nutrition Examination Survey that was conducted from 1999 till 2004. And they reported finding a measurable amount of dialkyl phosphate metabolites, such as DMTP in urine, does not mean that the level of metabolites causes an adverse health effect. Biomonitoring studies, so urine and, and blood tests, so biomonitoring studies of urine metabolites provide physicians, so doctors and public health officials with reference values so that they can determine whether or not people have been exposed to higher levels of pesticides. So basically all of this information that's been reported in the literature helps us to understand and interpret the results when we do a urine test on an exposed person. <clears throat> 
Um, Australian, I just thought I would just show a couple of slides here about uh, pesticide testing on our fruit and vegetables in Australia. So our government does test uh, at random samples of fruit and vegetables to see what concentration of pesticides is on the skin of the veg fruit or vegetable and within the, the fruit or vegetable. So a national residue survey found uh, it, so it tested almonds, apples, pears, onions, and macadamia nuts. They found apples to have 98.1% and all other horticultural tested to have 100% compliance with our Australian standards for residues on fruit and vegetables. Uh, the annual Australian total diet study in November 2011 found that there are no public health and safety issues associated with the current dietary exposures to agricultural and veterinary chemical residues in food for the Australian population. And so here's an example of some data from that Australian diet study. So they estimated the 90th percentile dietary exposure to chlorpyrifos as a percentage of the acceptable daily intake, particularly for children. So uh, you can see here nine month old, the levels they found were less than 10% of the acceptable daily intake. For two to five year olds, it was 20% uh, of, so below 20% of the acceptable intake. And for 17 years and above, it was sort of below 5% of the acceptable daily intake. So although in my PhD research, we did find detectable levels of urine metabolites of OP pesticides in the urine of non-occupationally exposed people and in the pre-exposure samples of farmers and the other people in the study, which is most likely come from dietary exposure uh, the levels are quite low and not associated with any known health effects. So I'll just finish off with uh, going back to the limitations of my PhD research. I did have quite a small sample size. It was a difficult study and difficult to recruit uh, study participants. So I ended up with quite small sample sizes. Um, I wish that I had have collected some environmental exposure data from the farmers and pilot mixer loaders to better understand their pre-exposure sample results and where that exposure may have come from. I couldn't collect blood samples from the farmers and the pilots and their ground crew, but that would have been good to have done that. And there could be some participation bias because it was volunteers, people volunteered to be involved. And so those who volunteer could be biased in terms of wanting to know the results. They might be more safety conscious than people who didn't volunteer. Um, and I restricted my study to fruit and vegetable farmers in the area around where I live, basically. So that's a few of the limitations of my study. <clears throat> so I'll just go back to my thank you slide. So I did have research support from my local uh, occupational Health and Safety Regulator, Workplace Health and Safety Queensland, as well as Work Cover New South Wales, and a Rural Industries Research and Development Corporation grant from the Australian Federal Government to do the research. Okay, I think that I can talk to you a bit more freely now and less formally in terms of answering questions. So over to you. Okay, thank you so much, Dr. Kelly, for your outstanding uh, explanations about the organophosphate pesticides exposures. So for the all participants uh, who wants to ask to Dr. Kelly, just uh, turn your unmute button and you can ask to Dr. Kelly or just uh, write your questions to the chat box message in this Zoom platform. Okay. Untuk peserta yang ingin bertanya kepada Dr. Kelly, uh, bisa di unmute uh, tombol unmute-nya atau bisa dituliskan di chat box di Zoom seperti itu.
Ya, silakan bagi yang mau bertanya. Uh, Dayinta, saya ada pertanyaan untuk Dr. Kelly. Baik, uh, silakan Bu Nurul. So, Dr. Kelly, this is uh, the question from Dr. Nurul Widajati. And for Dr. Nurul, kepada Bu Nurul boleh yes. ditanyakan. Thank you for lecture, Dr. Kelly. Uh, I have two questions for you. Mm -hmm. uh, question one, how to... How the role of the Australian government to protect agricultural workers from pesticide uh, exposure? And then uh, number two, can you explain to me how the Australian government provide health insurance uh, for agriculture agriculture workers affected by pesticide? Pesticide poisoning. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Two very good questions. Okay, first of all, how does the Australian government protect agricultural workers? Well, there are a few different ways that the government does this. First of all, any pesticides that are imported and or manufactured and sold in Australia have to be registered with the Australian government. So the Australian government has a department and I can't think of the name off the top of my head, but it's, it's a long name. And they basically register pesticides. So they require the people who want to sell pesticides in Australia to carry out testing of the safety of the pesticides um, and submit the test results to the government for approval. So first of all, we have the government regulates the types of pesticides that are allowed to be sold and used in Australia. That's and also regulate what crops certain pesticides are allowed to be sprayed on, that type of thing. So that's one way of regulating. Uh, the next thing is that each of our states and territories has an occupational health and safety regulator. So we don't, ha uh, we don't have one central system in Australia. Each of our different states and territories regulates for health and safety separately. Um, and in each, but, but similar, in each state and territory, we have, uh, for example, in Queensland, we have Workplace Health and Safety Queensland, and they are our government regulator, and they uh, have legislation about health and safety. And included in that legislation is quite strict requirements about the use of all types of chemicals, including hazardous <coughs> chemicals such as pesticides. So that's where we get legal requirements for suppliers to give the people they sell chemicals to an up-to-date safety data sheet. People have to have uh, correct labels on containers. People have to train their workers in how to use pesticides. They're supposed to do risk assessments. Um, they, yeah, they, it is quite heavily regulated. There are lots of laws to comply with, with regards to chemicals in Australia. I, I'm not necessarily saying that they are well enforced, but we do have a lot of legal requirements about the safe use of all types of chemicals, including pesticides. Um, we do have specific uh, inspectors for the agricultural industry. So within Workplace Health and Safety Queensland, we have a subgroup of government inspectors that are for the agricultural industry, and they have more knowledge in terms of uh, safety and health issues on farms, and they carry out both education and awareness as well as uh, enforcement of law on farms. Uh, but of course, like most countries, we don't have enough inspectors they don't have enough resources to visit every farm and to properly enforce the law necessarily. Okay, thanks, Dr. Kelly. Um, I think you had the other part of your question was about um, health insurance. Is that right? Yes, it's about health insurance for the second questions from Dr. Nurul, Dr. Yeah. Kelly. So this is, this is a bit of a difficult question to answer because in Australia, 
we have compulsory workers' compensation insurance. So if you are an employer, so in farms in Australia, if you have employed farm workers, those people under the law have to be covered by workers' compensation insurance. But the boss, the employer, doesn't have to cover themselves for workers' compensation insurance. They get the choice as to whether they want to take out workers' comp insurance. Um, so with the agricultural industry in Australia, we have a lot of family farms where the only worker is the father of the family and so he would not be covered by workers' compensation insurance unless he decided to do that himself. Um, but we do have a public health system in Australia. And so every Australian uh, has access to a public health system, which is quite a good system in Australia. So even without insurance, that person would have access to to doctors and hospitals for free through the public health system. I hope that answers the question. Okay. Thank you so much for the answer, Dr. Kelly, or uh, maybe I would like to explain your answers in Bahasa to all participants to make oh, okay. it yes. easier okay. to understand what you are saying. Yeah. So, untuk Uh, dari, jadi tadi Bu uh, Dr. Kelly uh, memberikan jawaban terhadap Bu Nurul terkait dengan uh, bagaimana uh, peran dari pemerintah Australia dalam melindungi uh, petaninya terkait uh, terhadap pestisida. Jadi pada uh, pemerintahan Australia mereka memberikan uh, inspeksi kemudian memberikan hmm, regulasi terkait berapa jumlah pestisida yang yang dipaparkan kepada Uh, pak, uh, kepada petani terkait dengan berapa uh, melak- uh, terkait dengan uh, melakukan testing berapa banyak pestisida yang akan dipaparkan dan dipakai di suatu ag- agricultural industry kemudian setelah dilakukan testing maka akan diberikan uh, pengumpulan hasil apakah hasil tersebut bisa diaplikasi uh, apakah pestisida penggunaan pestisida tersebut bisa diaplikasikan di dalam suatu in- agricultural industry tersebut. Kemudian selain itu uh, juga ada inspeksi, namun karena keterbatasan uh, resource, uh, sumber daya yang dimiliki oleh Workplace Occupational Health and Safety Queensland, maka uh, kegiatan inspeksi ini dilakukan secara terbatas. Seperti itu. Kemudian terkait dengan health insurance, uh, asuransi kesehatan, terdapat beberapa kompensasi yang diberikan oleh uh, pemerintah Australia, dan untuk uh, Keputusan mengikuti uh, asuransi tersebut, uh, program asuransi tersebut diserahkan kembali kepada setiap pekerja dan kepada seluruh uh, farmers maupun pilots dan uh, pekerja di bidang agrikultur tersebut seperti itu. Okay, thank you, Dr. Kelly. Then to all the participants, is there any questions for Dr. Kelly? Apakah ada pertanyaan lain untuk seluruh peserta? Uh, excuse me. Okay, so the time is yours. Uh, okay. Yeah. Okay. Uh, to okay, uh, doc, okay, Dr. Kelly. Uh, I think this is uh, interesting uh, uh, time about uh, agriculture, right? Uh, the using of pesticide in farmer. Uh, as we know that Indonesia is uh, most of the farmer in here are using manual spray, right? To mm-hmm. To use the pesticide, but in your research, I see yes. that most of the farmer in there using a plant or truck to to spread the pesticide. Uh, yeah. What do you think about that? I mean, is it is it any difference? Very uh, big. <laughs> yeah, is it any difference between using the manual spray and mm. uh, using truck or something like that? I think there is a big difference and that's a very good question because uh, in Australia, yes, we have some better systems. So farmers can have what we call totally enclosed systems where they have very little contact with the pesticide, even during mixing processes. So 
they can have quite good what we call engineering controls in place to minimize exposure. And so if I just share my screen again and go back to the picture of, um, oops, wrong screen, <laughs> sorry. I'll just share this picture here. Are you seeing the PowerPoint slide again? Yes, you see the PowerPoint picture? Yes, yes. Yeah, so the tractor. So the, you can see in the picture there, the farmer in the orange jacket there, he's mm -hmm. quite a distance away from the boom and the spray is directed down onto the ground. So with this type of application, he has minimal exposure to the pesticide unless something goes wrong. And so I found that if everything worked well, the farmers would have very little exposure. But if one of these nozzles gets broken or there's an issue with the spray rig and he gets out of his tractor and goes to clean it or adjust it, then he got a higher exposure. So this type of spraying, if it all goes well, results in very small exposure. But when you uh, use a backpack sprayer or manual applications, there's much greater opportunity for skin exposure and breathing it in. So I do know from research in Africa and other places around the world that where people spray with manual applications such as backpack sprayers, that there is a much higher exposure. Okay. Thank you so much, Dr. Kelly, for the answers. And for Mas Aji, apakah sudah terjawab? Yes, yeah, Sarah, sudah cukup. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Kelly, for the answer. So I have read the latest questions from the message box. It is from Aina Yariski. For Aina Yariski, do you want to unmute your microphone or I just tell it to Dr. Kelly? Oh, yeah. Uh, so, uh, Dr. Kelly, thank you for the interesting presentation. I would like to ask a question question regarding the MTP as the frequently found metabolite in the samples. Are there any certain symptoms in workers with high concentration of the MTP metabolite in their body? Thank you. That's a good question. Uh, the, the symptoms in the workers would be similar to symptoms from uh, general pestic organophosphate pesticide exposure. So you would have to have very high levels in your urine, like in the thousands of levels in your urine to have any health effects or show any symptoms of health effects. So you would need to have, I'll just, um, I just show you some guide, government, Queensland, I mean, Australian government guidance on interpreting the results of the urine test. Just give me a second and I'll change my screen. So, so this document here, are you seeing the document on my screen? This is the Australian government uh, health monitoring or health surveillance guidance for organophosphate pesticides. And it now includes guidance on using the urine test as a way of monitoring workers' exposure. Um, and in this guidance, I'll just have to get to it, sorry. Uh, yeah, so I'll just make this bigger. In this guidance here, you can see that Urine dialkyl phosphate levels less than 100 micromoles of creatine indicates low occupational exposure or high non-occupational exposure. And you, would, you wouldn't expect any symptoms at all from that level. 
Um, 100 to 1,000 is a medium level of exposure and you still would not expect any symptoms at that level. And then greater than 1,000 is associated with a drop in blood cholinesterase levels and is considered to be high occupational exposure. So it's not until levels in the thousands that you would expect to have any symptoms. So uh, that document is available on the Safe Work Australia website. And if you go to the Safe Work Australia website and you type in organophosphate, you'll get a copy of this document. And it's a good summary of um, biological monitoring or health monitoring for organophosphate pesticides. Does that help answer the question? Okay, thank you so it's much. Very clear. Thank you, Dr. Kelly. Okay, thank you, Ainaya, for the questions. Is there any questions? Further questions for Dr. Kelly? Uh, yeah, you and I want to ask. Okay. Uh, Hello, Dr. Kelly. Uh, thank you for your presentation. My name is Vian. I want to ask to you, uh, how about the recommendation or suggest for our workers or farmers, like, uh, for example, uh, about the time in the one day about use the pesticide, uh, pesticide? And is there any difference between use tractor or manual spray or the others? In, and is there any difference between we use pesticide in here and in over there, like the rules uh, in Indonesia or in your country? Thank you. I'm not sure if I understood all of your question. Do you want to just ask, ask again? Sorry? Uh, about the recommendation or suggest, like for example, how about the time uh, for the workers or farmers to use the pesticide and is there any uh, rules of the difference of we use a manual spray and in there use a tractor? Is there any difference uh, the suggest of for our workers or our farmer? Mm. Um, there's not really recommendations for the amount of time in the law in Australia that you can uh, be exposed to the chemical. Obviously, the shorter the time, the better. Because if you think about the dose of exposure that a person can receive, the more time that you work with a chemical, the more chances of exposure. So the more time you're doing it, the, the more likely you're going to get a hazardous dose of exposure. Uh, and then the question about different application methods. If you are using manual, uh, so knapsacks, um, hand pump applications, then it's much more likely that you're going to get the chemical on your skin and you are much closer to the spray. And so you're much more likely to breathe in the aerosols from the spray. And so when you're doing a manual spraying, there's a higher chance of exposure to the chemical than if you are sitting particularly in an air conditioned cab of a tractor with the boom all the way at the back, much less chance of exposure. Uh, in terms of timing as well, on the label of the pesticide, there's something called withholding periods uh, for the safety of the community. And so if you spray pesticides on a crop, on the label it tells you certain periods of time that you're not allowed to go back into that crop for your own exposure and you're not allowed to harvest that crop within certain time periods uh, because that would increase the exposure of the public if they consume or contact that product. So they have periods of time after spraying that people aren't allowed to go back into the crop and they're not allowed to harvest the crop. Uh, I wanna ask uh, doctor, in one day, is there any suggestion for uh, the work, the farmer like five hours for one day to use uh, pesticide or the others maybe? 
um, no, we don't have any limits on the amount of time that a person can be using the pesticide. But in my study, the fruit and vegetable growers would typically take, you know, four or five hours in a day of spraying the pesticide. And they might do that for a couple of days in a row to get all their spraying done. And then they don't need to spray again for months, maybe. So on average, they only had to spray 20 times in a year. So that's only, um, you know, once or twice a month, they would have to spray it on average. Okay, that's thank you. It's what they normally do. But there isn't any rules about that sort of thing. The only rules are about uh, once you do spray, you're not allowed to harvest that crop for a certain period of time. Okay, thank you so much, Dr. Kelly, for the answers. And thank you so much, Mabian, for the questions. And I will read the further questions from Rahmat, uh, Pak Rahmat Iswahyudi. Uh, to Pak Rahmat Iswahyudi, do you want to unmute your microphone or I read it for Dr. Kelly? Please read it for Dr. Kelly. But... Okay. Thank you so much, uh, Mr. Rahmat Iswahyudi. So, Dr. Kelly, this is uh, the questions from Dr. Rahmat with pa Rahmat Iswahyudi. So, I would like to ask a question: What is chemical substitutes for pesticides that more safe and environmentally friendly? What kind of the key parameter for regular medical checkup for pesticide handlers, and how to detox pesticide exposure? Thank you. Okay. Good questions. Uh, we do have safer alternatives to organophosphate pesticides. Um, so pyrethroids are considered to be a safer alternative to organophosphate pesticides. Um, but of course, any options that don't include spraying a pesticide of any kind is going to be better. And so I'm not an expert in agriculture. <laughs> I'm an expert in occupational health and safety. But I do know that there are options for pest control that don't include spraying pesticides. So they could be things like crop rotation, um, those types of things, use, use of uh, natural um, sounds and other things that people can do to deter pests. So there has, there has been research on way, ways of farming that are less likely to result in pest infestations. So rather than growing the same crop over and over again in the same area, if you rotate the crops that you grow, uh, you can reduce the need to spray pesticides. So there are new ways of being able to grow your product that means that you don't have to spray as much. Uh, but I'm not an expert in those fields. I just know that there are ways to grow crops that mean that you're less likely to have to spray pesticides. Uh, but yes, pyrethroids, for example, are safer than organophosphate pesticides. Um, then what else? Regular medical checkups, yes. So this document that I shared before, let me share it again. This document here, um, Safe Work Australia Health Monitoring Guide for Organophosphate Pesticides, this is the Australian Government Guide for Medical Checkups for pest people who are exposed to organophosphate pesticides. So it talks about um, procedures to follow to um, test for exposure, urine and blood tests. It talks about a medical checkup with a doctor. So collection of demographic, medical and occupational history a physical examination. Uh, and so health monitoring should be carried out before a worker first starts using organophosphate pesticides. Um, and then on a regular basis, maybe once each um, season with, with a doctor to be examined. And then when the person finishes working with pesticides, so down here, 
at termination. They do a final medical examination. Uh, and if level, high levels are found, then there are procedures for removing the worker from the workplace so that they're no longer exposed to the pesticide until they are healthy again, uh, or removing them from the types of jobs that would expose them to pesticides. So there's procedures in this document that explain <coughs> all of that. So if you're interested in knowing more about requirements for medical examinations, health checkups and uh, health surveillance, then this is the document to get from the Safe Work Australia website. Um, and how to detox pesticide exposure. Uh, if a person has an acute exposure to organophosphate pesticides, they can be administered with a drug that reverses the chemical reaction. Um, and so if a person gets an acute poisoning and they're very sick, they can be taken to hospital and the hospital can give them a drug that will reverse the chemical reaction between the organophosphate pesticide and acetylcholine esterase. So there is a drug that can be given that uh, quickly reverses that chemical reaction to help the person uh, recover and stop them potentially from dying from an acute exposure. But that's done in an emergency situation. Uh, normally, if a person just is a farmer working with pesticides on a regular basis, then there's nothing done for detox. The best, the best method is to prevent exposure. So that's the aim, is to prevent um, breathing it in, stop it from getting on your skin, minimise exposure. And remembering that getting it through your skin is the most common method of it getting into your body. So you need to protect your skin and wash carefully after using pesticides. Change your clothes, wash your clothes and wash your skin. Okay, thank you, Dr. Kevin. Okay, thank you very much, Dr. Kelly, for the outstanding explanations. And for the all participants, uh, the question and answer session is still open for all the participants who want to ask some questions to Dr. Kelly. You are allowed. I'm happy. I'm happy to answer questions about our degree at UQ, um, studying at UQ. Uh, happy for you to tell me about what you're studying at your university. Doesn't have to be about my presentation. Ya, pertanyaannya boleh tidak selalu mengacu kepada materi yang disampaikan oleh Dr. Kelly. Boleh uh, banyak hal mengenai occupational and health and safety tentang K3, seperti itu. Uh, Dr. Kelly, uh, can you give me guidelines health monitoring for organophosphate from Australia? Uh, sorry, you're just hard to hear there. Very quiet. Yeah. Okay, Dr. Kelly, uh, can you give me guidelines health monitoring for organophosphate from Australia? Uh, can Get I get lines? Get lines and so Dr. Kelly, how to access the health monitoring from Safe Work Australia that you have shared to us from your share screen, latest share screen. Uh, can you give us the documents or how to access that documents? Um, I can email uh, Dr. Narel the documents. Okay. Uh, thank you, Dr. Kelly. Uh, Bunuh nanti akan di-email oleh Dr. Kelly terkait dokumennya, seperti itu. Oke. Okay. Oke, okay, thank you very much Dr. Kelly for the response. And to all the participants who wants to ask some questions to Dr. Kelly, you are still allowed because we have still have 30 minutes for this question and answer. Kita masih punya waktu 30 menit untuk sesi tanya jawab kepada peserta yang ingin bertanya, dipersilahkan. 
Maybe I will ask you a question. So uh, do you know how to use the reactions button in Zoom? Like put your hand up thing on Zoom like this. Uh, do you know how to do that? Okay, the raise hands uh, tools, isn't or, it? Or you can raise your hand, that's right. So how many of you are studying your bachelor's degree in occupational health and safety? Put your hand up. Maybe that maybe they're not listening anymore. <laughs> um, and are you in your first year, your second year, or your third third year of your study? Okay, uh, yeah. silakan mungkin dari bapak ibu dosen Dayinta, tidak hanya dari departemen K3, ini kebetulan ada dari departemen uh, Environmental Health, ya. Ada Bu Aziza, kemudian Bu siapa tadi? Terus uh, Kusuma Scorpia Lestari, tadi juga ikut join mungkin bisa diberi kesempatan untuk bertanya, silakan. Uh, mungkin juga Dr. Kelly punya referensi yang uh, dosen yang terkait dengan environmental health di Consilence, dan mungkin bisa menyampaikan di pertemuan ini. Okay. Kan sayang kalau enggak. Baik, baik. So, Dr. Kelly, this is... Uh... The message from Dr. Nurul. Uh, there, there are some lecturer from environmental department, not only from occupational health department. So I would like to give the lecturer from the environmental department to discuss further about uh, some environmental issues, maybe. And I would like to uh, welcome Bu Aziza or Bu Scorpia to ask further or discuss further to Dr. Kelly. Kepada Bu Azizah atau Bu Kusuma Scorpia boleh uh, berdiskusi kepada Dr. Kelly atau ingin uh, menanyakan beberapa hal kepada Dr. Kelly. Oke, okay, thank you so much Dainita dan Ibu Nurul for a time yeah. for us here yeah, for me. Halo Dr. Kelly. I'm from Environmental Health Department. Uh, I think Environmental Health and uh, Occupational Health very, very, apa, very near relation about the air pollution. Like, uh, like your presentation uh, for us, for our depart our department, we have a research about the occupation, but. Uh, for uh, for public health about the major air pollution air pollution in the agriculture like that so if you want to uh, research maybe we can join publication with your your friend or in Australia, we can we can join about the environmental health. Maybe uh, Dr. Kelly have a friend about the environmental health department in your university. I think yes. not only about the occupational because uh, our research about the environmental health, like air pollution, like air food uh, hygiene, sanitation, like a sanity environmental sanitation many many research uh, in our department maybe uh, we we want to join like that uh, our research do you have a friend dr kelly in your yes. department or in your university thank yes. you so much dr kelly we have uh, in my school we have environmental scientists who do uh, research on uh, mainly the effects for non-humans, so mainly, mainly effects for animals and the environment. Oh. But we also do have, in a different school, um, a public health department. And so I am good friends with three or four academics that 
uh, epidemiologists and public health experts that uh, do research on air quality and uh, public health or environmental health issues. So I do, I do have colleagues who are good friends of mine who do research in that area. Okay, thank you so much. Maybe next time we can uh, join research, maybe join publication and like that, like as lecture, like that. So thank you so much, Dr. Kelly and Bu Nurul dan Mbak Dainita. Maybe next time we can uh, we can meet again. Yes, thank you so much. <laughs> yes. yes. Thank you so much, Bu Aziza. Thank you so much, Dr. Kelly, for the discussions. Uh, so, because the limitation of this time, uh, maybe we can end our agenda mm -hmm. in five, uh, four, four forty, four forty p.m. So before we end up our agenda, our guest lecture agenda, uh, we would like to send you the highest appreciation and highest gratitude. We are thankful for your presentations, for your materials that, and I hope we can uh, increase our knowledge about, especially about agricultural risk exposure and how to tackle with all the hazards in agricultural industry. So uh, by the symbol of this appreciations, I would like to show the highest appreciations by the certificate for you, Dr. Kelly, as our guest lecture agenda, uh, our guest lecture, and for Bu Nurul Widajati, uh, bisa memberikan sepatah dua kata, patah kata, ucapan terima kasih kepada Dr. Kelly. Okay, thank you, Dayinta. I'm very pleasure, Dr. Kelly. Uh, please, uh, my department want to give you a certificate because you have a given lecture uh, for my students. I hope future this webinar can be continued research collaboration uh, Queensland University and Erlangga University. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. And I just want to say that we at the University of Queensland are always happy to look at ways to work with other universities uh, we have a bachelor's degree in our university in occupational health and safety uh, and a master's degree. And we take on master of philosophy research students and PhD research students and are always happy to look at collaborative research with other universities. So okay. thank you. <laughs> thank you for the invitation to speak and to meet you all. Nice to meet you too. <laughs> Okay, thank you so much, Dr. Nurul and Dr. Kelly. Uh, so I would like to end up my screen share. Uh, mungkin bisa dibuka semua videonya. Kita sama-sama berfoto dengan Dr. Kelly. So before we end our agenda, we would like to take some pictures. Uh, we want... Bapak, ya, Bu Nurul. <laughs> One minute, and I'll just change my background to a um, a university background. Okay. I'll take it. Give you a nice. Um, that's a university building background. <laughs> that's so wonderful buildings. <laughs> okay. Uh, untuk peserta boleh dibuka uh, kameranya di open cam. Kita akan melakukan foto bersama. Okay, so maybe Mbak Gita, Mbak Arum, Mbak Karisma, Mbak Indah, Mas Wardana, Mas Haji, Mbak Salsa mungkin, Mbak Angela, Mbak Arira, Mbak Dianida. Dibuka sebentar saja untuk dokumentasi acara. Oke. Okay. Mungkin saya screenshot sekarang, Bu Nurul. Oke, okay, silakan, Dan. So, I would like to take the picture. So, everyone, please cheese, say cheese, and one, two, three. One, two, three. Cheese. Oke. Okay. 
for the first room, I have screenshot. And for the second slides, everyone, one, two, three, cheese. Okay. Once more, for everyone, the participants, one, two, three, cheese. Okay. Yeah, I have. Yeah, I have screenshot all the windows. So thank you so much, Dr. Kelly, for your uh, presentations and materials. It's so interesting for us. And I hope we all, the students, also direct the lecturer will increase our knowledge. Also, we could join our research uh, between Erlanga University and Queensland University. Also, uh, I hope that we, the students of Erlanga University, could have some opportunity to get some scholarships maybe in Australia, especially in Queensland University. Thank you so much, Dr. Kelly. Thank you so much, Bunuru Widajati. Thank you so much, all the lecturer in Erlanga University, Pak Deni, Bu Indri, Pak Abdul Rahim Praleka, Bu Putri, Bu Cynthia, dan seluruh dosen di Departemen K3 FKM UNAR. Terima kasih. Thank you so much, Dr. Kelly. And uh, lastly, uh, I would like to close this webinar agenda. Thank you very much. Good afternoon. Wassalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Waalaikumsalam warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Goodbye. Thank you, Bye, Dr. Kelly. Nice to meet you. Thank you, Dr. Thank you, Dr. Kelly. Bye. Nice to meet you, Dr. Kelly. Bye. Bye.